Well, I want to welcome everybody who came here tonight. It's really fantastic we can do a social event again. I suppose the last time we did it was around about January of 2020. So it's really nice to be able to do this. And it's really nice too that we can use, utilize Zoom so people at home can link in as well. And I was a bit worried about the technical uh, problems that might arise since I hadn't done this before, but it seems to be working out well. So it's good to have you on, Rich. And I never knew he was a birder, and I sure there was not a birder in those days. But Rich has been in the bird world for a long, long time. And if you look at his resume I put in the squawker, it's too long to uh, recite just here. So Rich is going to spend a lot of time in the tropics in Central America, in Guatemala, Panama. I'm not sure if you've been and spent much time in Costa Rica, but in the, in the other places around there, you do. He, we, we were talking about what his presentation might be, and it's, he had this idea of talking about the relationship between ants, the army ants, and birds. And we don't normally talk about those sorts of things, but as part of the sort of fabric of life, the whole cycle of life, the interaction between the different uh, species, different types, of, the different kingdoms, is what I should say. So that's what uh, Rich is going to talk to us about tonight. I think it's going to be really interesting to uh, do that. So, Rich, I'm going to hand it over to you. Well, thanks, Barry, for the introduction, and thanks for the opportunity to um, put this PowerPoint together for your uh, chapter of Audubon. And uh, so, as Barry mentioned, um, I spend a um, reasonable amount of time in uh, Central America over the last 11 years, um, where we do these annual March field trips into Belize, and then a side trip, uh, typically uh, two nights and two and a half days into Tikal National Park in Guatemala. But recently, uh, Janet and I have made uh, field trips into uh, Panama and into Costa Rica. Our last trip into Panama really piqued our interest on the army ants and their relationship with um, all the different ant birds that uh, we hear about and see photos of, whether it be National Geographic or leafing through a field guide, all these little colorful birds that uh, have their lives uh, tied in with the army ants. And we're going to try to cover that tonight at the layman's level. I'm not an ornithologist, I'm a birder that gets out and around and I have my little birding company, Yellow Bill Tours. I think this is my fourth presentation um, to Central Sierra Audubon. So here we go. So neotropic birds that forage with army ant, army ant swarms are colorful, like this little toady mop mop, for an example. Uh, he looks really large on the screen, but it's a seven inch bird and it's closely related to king, uh, kingfishers, and it nests in uh, holes of uh, riverbanks, road cuts, um, natural uh, hillsides that might um, be exposed to the sun. So it nests in, in, in earthen holes quite a bit like the kingfisher does. Um, this particular little guy is the smallest of the Motmot family. Some get up to 17 inches in length, and they have these big paddle-like tails, but uh, this fella here is uh, uh, an ant follower, an army ant follower. Uh, he has a serrated bill. He does eat ants, but his bill is uh, also will get small lizards um, and other invertebrates that the army ants may kick up. So uh, this is part of the ecology of the army ant is the different types of birds and what their um, uh, relationship is for feeding and for protection. Uh, from uh, exhibitors in the forest and uh, efficiency in feeding. So here we go. So uh, a lot of birders are drawn to the neotropics for the unique birds. Many visitors to Belize and Guatemala are seeking raptors like the bat falcon here that we have. Other birders are drawn to the colorful forest birds, which are seen low in the forest, like the ant um, uh, obligates that we're going to see tonight. And a little bit on the mixed flock ecology. So the habitat of the terrestrial birds, these ground birds can be found all over the world, but tonight we're gonna to focus on Central America bird species. Most important is the mixed flock um, species are not eating the ants. And um, this was interesting when I first you know, got into um, the relationship between the ants and the wow. birds and discovered that they're not eating the ants. These birds are, uh, feeding on the insects that the army ants are after and 
the insects, whether um, moths, spiders, crickets, small prey, are, f are fleeing from these large swarms of uh, army ants. And some of these swarms can be like 60 feet wide, several hundred feet long, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of ants. And they're just on the forest floor, uh, going through the leaf litter, going through uh, rotten tree trunks and fallen branches. And they're just out to um, their feeding. This is how they feed. And um, when they find a, a prey, like for instance, a cricket or maybe a grasshopper or a moth, then it doesn't, one, one of the um, uh, army ants will uh, claw onto it. I have a big enlarged photo of the army ant coming up and you'll see some of the weapons it has. Once they get um, their talons onto um, any one of the small prey, they'll hold it down and then it will be mobbed by the other uh, army ants and of course fed on. So the method uh, that the birds use following the army ants is basically to improve their uh, foraging efficiency. Uh, they don't have to expend a lot of energy flying all over uh, the rainforest uh, seeking food. They just follow the ants and the ants are so efficient and so aggressive um, that the uh, insects and moths and crickets, et cetera, uh, are, are well aware of what the army ant swarms can do and they're getting out of the way. And then they have uh, the birds to contend with because the birds are there ready to pick them off and feed on them. We have a couple of videos coming up. They're short, but they'll give you an idea of um, the ant swarm and how the birds uh, feed and use that um, relationship. Uh, the other uh, factor that comes into play is um, we have uh, uh, what we call sentry birds, and we'll cover those in a minute. And they offer uh, alert protection against uh, predators that may be coming in to these uh, mixed um, species flocks feeding. The birds are so interested in feeding, uh, they lose their attention on um, protecting themselves from, say, excipiters, cooper's hawks, sharp shin hawks, owls, and the um, sentry birds uh, give an alert. And we'll see more of that here in a few minutes. So here's Central America and the Neotropics. Um, you see Belize, that's a favorite of ours. We've been there, as I mentioned, uh, 11, 11 years now. Every March, we take a trip there. And uh, we do a side trip into uh, Tikal National Park. So here's Belize, okay, Mexico, obviously. and um, we come down in through here and not far, about 50 miles past the Belize Guatemala border is to call National Park. And uh, we usually do two days there, uh, maybe two and a half days, two nights. Um, we've also been through Costa Rica. And as I mentioned, we've been down into the Darien district, uh, way down here into Panama, right above Colombia. And uh, in all of these locations, uh, we have seen and witnessed army ants, these swarms just going across uh, the jungle uh, uh, soil and, and going through the leaf matter. And you see big swarms of them, they're very impressive and they don't um, bother um, the humans. Um, in fact, the guides that we use um, to supplement my, my leadership uh, are all very sensitive to not stepping on the army ants. There's sort of a, an affection of uh, field guides towards the army ants because they're so unique. So Central America is the base basis of tonight's topic for a habitat. And uh, when we're in the jungle, and we do do some hiking out of our cars and our vans, um, and this particular trail was a round trip six miles, and we ran into a shade um, tree coffee farming, uh, which, as we all know, uh, reading magazines and articles and um, about the forest destruction in South America. Uh, and shade tree coffee maintains a tropical forest habitat. It also supports an income for the local citizens. So always interested in, in the social end of our trips and the cultures that uh, we interface with. So this, these are coffee trees. Uh, these are coffee trees. This particular plot had maybe 80 coffee trees under the canopy of the, uh, of the jungle. And um, in this next uh, PowerPoint, we have the coffee beans that are harvest, harvested. And you can see they're just in a regular old plastic uh, container. People are out in the jungle, uh, the inhabitants of the villages. Uh, here's someone's hand and he's pulling back the leaves for me to take this photo. 
Uh, the beans are red. And uh, when they bring them into their villages, they set them out on these tarps and dry them. Uh, a little footnote on this, don't want to spend a lot of time on the cultural end, but it's interesting. When Barry and I were uh, developing, um, actually doing a dry run last night, Barry asked me, you know, how much are these people paid? How are they paid for collecting the coffee beans? So I did a little Google search today, and there's quite a bit of information or I should say links, is to um, the economics of uh, organic shade tree coffee. But none of them really tell us <laughs> how much the uh, indigenous people are paid um, and how they're paid, whether it's by the pound or by the ounce. What I did find out is that major um, uh, coffee brewers and roasters, such as these two guys, here's the one we can get at Safeway, this one's from American Birding Association. Um, I enjoy the Guatemala coffee from Safeway, but we all have our own little opinions on coffee. So what happens is, uh, according to my Google search, coffee comes in from Central America, uh, organic uh, shade tree coffee, um, and it's, it has a rate of 57 cents an ounce. That includes everything from shipping, warehousing, picking all the overhead and so if you take uh, 57 cents and multiply it by 16 ounces it's about eight dollars a pound out of that 57 cents i don't know how much is paid uh, to the um, indigenous people to the uh, to the the farmers themselves they may get a dime an ounce i have no no idea but i we thought that was interesting so i did a little extra google google search so when you buy the coffee for something like $6 for, I think, 12 ounces, it's about 57 cents an ounce. And that's their overhead. Okay. Oops, what happened here? Don't want to end the show. There we go. So the army ant uh, in ecology is a very interesting story. Uh, the ant swarms that forage for insects, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, come out in these large volumes, thousands of ants in a swarm. Um, these large assembly of the army ants are called raids. And um, they've been studied very thoroughly. If you uh, have an interest after tonight's presentation, if you just Google army ant ecology, there is so much information. They have really been studied. And I found out uh, just as another uh, sidebar conversation, one of the reasons why the army ant is uh, studied so thoroughly is they're really um, uh, sensitive to cold. So um, uh, ecologists can capture these ants and if they put them into a cold mode, uh, they actually go into a tober and then they can bring them into laboratories and resuscitate them with um, room temperature and they can study how they interact. And it was pretty interesting. So army ants, um, can actually be captured, if you will, for lack of a better word, and brought into a laboratory and um, put back into room temperature and fed, and they can be studied. And um, so there's a lot of information. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, these raids can be up to 60 feet wide, uh, several hundred feet long. And uh, when you're out birding in the uh, Central America, South America, tropical forests, uh, there's a high likelihood you over a couple of days, you might see at least one of these raids uh, crossing um, a trail or maybe being on the same trail with you. And that becomes interesting because that's when we start looking for uh, the uh, ant birds that are support, that have a relationship with the army ant for feeding and predator control. So here's what a, a large army ant looks like. And Earlier, I was talking about their talons and how they can latch onto a, a large cricket or a grasshopper or a large moth. And of course, this is very large. Um, the last photo back here uh, sort of showed more of an actual size. And they have quite a sting, we're told. I've never been stung by them, but um, other people have, and they talk about their sting. And uh, you can see it's a it's sort of a war machine. It's a, it's quite a, a body there that's all total functional. And something else um, that we uh, discovered is these heads. 
Uh, the soldiers of the army ants have these large heads and specialized mandibles for defense. Um, and they, they weight down and they grab and they bite and they claw. And then they have these legs that uh, dig in. You can see their feet have small claws and um, that um, makes them a real formidable uh, threat because once they catch you, you're not gonna get away. They have all these uh, adapted, whether it be the feet with claws or these large mandibles with claws, um, they're not gonna get away from you. And then with the larger heads, they bear down and put pressure on whatever uh, the prey is. So an interesting ecology for the bird. Another interesting fact is they're nomadic. Uh, they don't really nest in the ground. They do have a, a, a network of queens. There may be a number of queens in one of their colonies. Um, and the queens, of course, mate with a number of the males and they're fed and protected. But once again, they, they do not nest in the ground. They'll nest in logs. They'll nest in animal holes that might be dug, like say a badger, for instance, probably a bad example for the tropics, um, but a hole, or they even can create hanging masses from, uh, from trees. And what happens in that, um, the follower uh, ants um, that aren't the army ants, the worker ant, uh, their bodies can detach and they can uh, stay alive. They'll keep the head, but this portion connects to another ant and another ant, and they form these, um, uh, what we call the colonial cycle. Um, and they'll just hang from a tree or form a bridge across wet areas if it's raining. And they're very, very functional as a species. So the army ant uh, not having a, a nest hole in the ground, uh, their uh, colonial cycle, and they go through this several times a year uh, when they do reproduction. And if the um, ant raid gets too large, some of the queens will split off and take some of the males with them and start a whole new colony. So they have three cycles, the colonial, there's a stationary phase. If it's really raining hard, or if, it's, if they're in a sunny area and it's either too hot or if it's too cold, they, uh, they go into uh, a stationary phase. And uh, this is important. Well, I'll cover this a, a little bit further on and how the birds, uh, the sentry birds specifically, uh, track these stationary phases. Because once the um, sentry birds or centennial birds that we have, sentry birds, excuse me, uh, know where the stationary phases are, they'll stay put. And um, when the birds come back into their nomadic phase, um, uh, the sentry birds will be one of the first to feed as the army ants start to go through the forest kicking up insects. So it's a really complex uh, relationship, both for the army ants on their own in their own culture, and then uh, how they relate to um, the ant birds. So here's an ant bird. This is what we call a sentry bird. It's a barred ant strike, and it's often found in these mixed species flocks acting as a leader. So you may not see this bird on the ground if you're on a, on a birding field trip in, uh, in the tropics. More than likely, you're going to see it maybe shoulder length high, a little bit higher in a tree, and um, watching the army ants and for predators. And uh, it's a leader bird. It's a sentry bird. And it, um, it will feed much sooner uh, than the big mix flocks that come through. Very beautiful bird, very vocal. So I've talked a little bit about sentry birds and followers and predators. So uh, the mix flock species supports three types of participants. The sentry bird, or the leader, it is sometimes called. Uh, the examples are the uh, ant shrike and the barred ant shrike. Uh, we'll see a photo, a couple photos of a male and a female here in a moment. Then we have what are called the followers. Uh, there are many birds that engaged in these mixed flock uh, feeding communities, up to 1140 uh, that I could find. There's wood creepers and oven birds, about 294 species. There's ant birds, ant pettas, and ant thrushes. There's 275 of the species of, of those three. Um, gnat catchers, fly, catch, uh, fly catchers, 435. Uh, species feed on the, uh, along with the army ants, mannequins, another 57, and cotingas and bacards, 71 species. So a total 
that I could find uh, going through field guides and online uh, searching uh, came up with this count. So um, I'm locking myself down here. The third uh, participants are the predators. Um, Stippeters, hawks, owls uh, are all um, forest uh, hunters and um, they will feed in the mixed flocks if in fact uh, the participants, they're down on the ground and they lose their attention because they're, they're feeding. And these birds, these uh, predator birds, these raptors will come in, as we know, and, and snag one and have dinner with it. And that's why we have these birds. These are the sentry birds. They're typically larger, like the anchorite, that uh, barred anchorite that we saw a moment ago. Uh, this bird here is about nine inches. It's a female anchorite tanager. Um, and uh, basically they sit pretty quiet. Um, as you can see, this one's on a limb high above the, uh, the ground where the leaf litter is and the uh, army ants are uh, moving. And uh, uh, her function is to now to look for predators. I'm gonna skip ahead and then I'm gonna come back. Uh, here's the male of the same species, black-throated uh, antrike sentry bird. So the males and females uh, work together. Um, basically, they have two separate zones that they manage. They have feeding zones and they, um, they know when the army ants go into, um, into this stationary phase and they follow the army ants. They're sort of in tune with their life cycles. When they know that they're in a situation uh, that doesn't please them and they haven't gone into a full colony cycle, they know they're gonna come out of the stationary phase at some point where it has to do with temperature or moisture and go into this nomadic stage. And when that happens, they take notice and they have their own dominant uh, zones that they watch over and they will feed first uh, before they put out any signals for other uh, ant birds to come in and feed. So their relationship is twofold, threefold. They have a dominant area that they know has army ants and they follow them and they're in tune with their uh, life cycle. And um, they, uh, once they feed, they get to uh, go back into the forest and watch for predators. So um, it's a interesting relationship. You can see uh, this is um, uh, Tanninger, Shrike Tanninger, has a very uh, stout bill and it has a hook on the end. And it's a bigger bird, as I mentioned, than some of the smaller ones we'll see here in the next slides. But um, like the uh, opening photo of the toady Mot Mot uh, with that stout serrated bill, the, these particular uh, birds go after a little bit bigger prey than uh, some of the smaller birds that we're gonna see here. Here's the male. Uh, the male has his own dominant uh, feeding zone, uh, army ant uh, raid area, and he is in touch also with the life cycle of the army ants um, when they're in that middle stage and they're getting ready to come out to go searching for food, the nomadic stage. Uh, but he also feeds uh, the female uh, when she's on the nest. And it's not clear in um, everything that I was able to uh, glean information from if he takes over her dominant uh, feeding zone while she's incubating. But they have a good relationship. They talk back and forth. And when you're in the, in the uh, tropics, um, many times before you see the um, mixed uh, bird species um, on the ground, you'll hear uh, the black-throated shrike tanager or another sentry birds calling back and forth. And uh, once you get into that um, song system into your mind and you have some level of um, frequency of knowing what to look for, it isn't long after you hear the bird calls, you start looking on the ground and you start seeing these mixed flocks feeding. Um, when you look down on the ground, you might find these army ant uh, soldiers. They're easily identified because of the bigger heads and powerful mandibles. Um, this is a still shot, shows them uh, walking across the leaf litter. So a lot of insects, I witnessed uh, this last March in uh, Tikal. 
I saw a big uh, green beetle just scurry into one of these rounded leaves. You know, all these army ants were all over. And uh, the beetle just took off and knew what was going to happen if he, if he didn't hide. And, um, and so the army ants were walking right over him. I don't know if they hunt by smell or by sight, but they certainly missed that particular beetle. But you can see the, the level of leaf litter uh, and leaves are always dropping in the tropics as you're walking uh, on these trails. They're always full of leaf litter. And um, on, unlike our forests that get burnt uh, to the ground and then we start all over, their forest just keeps regenerating um, vegetation. Oops, we don't want that. We want this. There we go. So the followers, um, this is just a brief recap in case. Um, you needed to see it again. We have up to uh, 1140 birds that I could identify through field guides and going online that are the followers that count on the uh, sentry birds that we have here um, for protection and to be alerted that the army ant swarms are uh, on their way, they're moving, uh, they're in their nomad stage and they're off feeding. So the follower birds, are really tied into uh, the sentry birds as well as the ant movements and their life cycle. <clears throat> Once again, a recap. Um, and I think the most important thing here is uh, the relationship between the ant birds, the sentry birds, and even um, the predators is uh, the method of following the army ants improves the uh, foraging efficiency of these ground birds and for instance, um, the predators, the, the raptors, owls, um, they get a sequence in their own mind when they hear possibly the uh, sentry birds calling back and forth. They might be alerted that these ant swarms are on the move and that there's birds that will be feeding and maybe lose focus on uh, who's around and they'll be picked off and eaten by a raptor, an occipiter, an owl. So here's a... Um, um, I hope you can see this. So uh, the key thing here is to look, um, I think, I hope my cursor is going around on the screen. It may not. But between these two birds, uh, I'm going to click on a video. And uh, don't focus so much on the birds, but focus on the ants that you're going to see. Can you see all those little black dots just all over the forest floor? So that's what happens. So these uh, ant swarms, let's play it again. Um, so these ant swarms are shaking up um, insects and these three wood creepers are ready for something. And there they go. Uh, let's just pretend a, a beetle or a moth, a small moth may have been kicked up. They don't waste any time on getting on that particular, uh, that particular piece of prey. Uh, you know, we keep going to end show. We don't want to do that. Okay. Um, one more time. These are wood creepers, much different than our wood creepers. You can see the size of them and they're feeding. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so there are other ants that we see in the forest, and these are the leaf cutter ant swarms. And let's watch them go to work. So these are uh, really interesting. They're not as numerous. Um, and of course, they're hauling leaves around, and that's what they feed on vegetarian. And um, uh, something's going on with auto quarterly there. Um, so uh, you can see they're shaking up other insects, but there are no uh, real um, ant birds following the leaf cutter ants because the um, the prey species, the crickets and uh, spiders and moths aren't afraid of the leaf cutter ants, so they just hold their ground and stay on the rocks. Let's play this one again one more time. Uh, look for other things going on beside the. Um, there we go. So, when you're out birding in the tropics, and probably many of you have been birding, you've probably seen leaf cutter ants, and they're just moving right along there. How about that? <laughs> Cute. Let's get through that. So these are some of the birds that we just saw uh, feeding with the army ants. There's 15 species of wood creepers in Central America. Uh, 
This is the Northern Bard, and we saw him in that one video, or it, we saw it in the video. Um, and the other bird that was in the video was the uh, ruddy woodcreeper. Uh, this guy is 11 inches, and this guy is a little bit bigger than an American robin. And uh, typically, um, we see wood creepers on trees, uh, on dead logs. Um, but when an army ant swarm is around and they're alerted to it, they'll feed on the ground on the army ants. Excuse me, not on the army ants, but along with the army ants. Moving right along. Here's another bird that you'll see um, that is an obligate to the army ants. And it's a very small tanager. Of course, um, we're all used to seeing our tanagers in pine trees, summer tanagers, western tanagers, paddock tanagers. Um, these bird, these tanagers are foraging on the ground. It's a very beautiful bird. Um, it's a little bit bigger than what this photo leads to. Uh, they're they're not common per se. Uh, you have to look for them. And once again, they're in the deep forest and they're waiting for the army ants to kick up uh, prey and they don't make themselves too noticeable. So this photo was taken um, in to call in March of this year. Uh, sexes look alike. They have this bushy gray head. Um, underparts are yellow and rich olive green. They have a very um, rich squeaky song. So you can uh, you can pick them out from other other birds in the ant swarms. Very colorful bird. Another um, obligate to the army ants um, life cycle is the red throated ant tanager. Uh, these birds are a communal bird, sort of like our our acorn woodpeckers. You find them in small family groups, up to eight birds. Not nearly as loud, and you'll find them on the ground for the most part or maybe 12, 18 inches above the ground in, in shrubs. Uh, this particular species is um, on the Caribbean side of uh, Belize and Guatemala. Of course, the continental divide runs through um, Belize and Guatemala. So we have the Caribbean side, and then of course we have the Pacific side, which is mostly in Guatemala. Uh, this bird is uh, uncommon in the same habitat on the Pacific side and it is replaced by the red crown ant tanager. Uh, this ant tanager is found a little bit um, higher up, higher elevation, uh, and the habitat remains the same in the tropics. It's a lot of leaf litter, uh, regardless of what the elevation is. Um, you have more clouds, a little more moisture at the higher elevations, cloud forests. Um, but this bird is uncommon on the Caribbean side, and not all that common on the Pacific side. You really have to be in the higher elevations uh, to get a look at it. Also, um, without failing to mention, it does follow the army ant swarms or raids. Um, ant birds can be spectacular like this oscillated ant bird. Uh, this one comes from Panama, um, photo taken in January. And some of the uh, ant birds are just, you know, really made up of so many wonderful feathers. Look at the black chin feathers on this, all the way down into the bib and underneath the cheek, along the neck, almost into the nape. Look at the stout bill on it also. And look at the big eye uh, that's made for uh, looking in dark um, environments in the tropic forest on the ground where things are typically dark and a lot of canopy and shrubs and, and just, you know, general forest um, rubble thrown around. That eye, they can, they see so much more than what we could possibly understand. Another um, uh, ant shrike is the black hooded. Notice the heavy beaked um, bill on it with a hook. And it's for grabbing the larger insects that the army ants might kick up. Uh, so he has to be very, very specific about what, uh, what he's going to feed on to use that bill. He's not going to be down on the ground picking up little morsels. He's waiting for a larger insect. Um, so, But all of these birds are in the lowlands, in the wood, woodlands of the forest. This particular one um, 
its habitat is around the water edge and mangroves and cypress and follows the army ant uh, swarms that may be coming through that area. Sometimes these birds don't feed for a week at a time. Um, they'll just uh, be waiting and waiting for um, one of these nomad swarms to come through uh, and wait to, um, to pick up insects that are, uh, are fleeing from the army ants. So <clears throat> it's sort of like our golden eagle uh, and uh, turkey vultures in North America. Uh, they don't fly around a lot. They don't, you know, beat their wings um, like, say, for instance, a red-tailed hawk because they don't know when they're going to feed again and uh, they want to save their calories. And so these birds, some of these larger billed birds with hooks just um, have to uh, slow down, take it easy while the army ants are in uh, their tepper mode waiting for them to come out and get the larger insects. So it's really... Um, affects also everything the army ant is doing affects up to 1140 species of birds at different feeding times, different levels, different parts of the forest. And we also have uh, woodpeckers. This golden olive woodpecker, um, this photo is from Panama. It feeds, uh, as we all know, woodpeckers feed on wood boring insects. Um, but this particular one, sort of like our uh, northern flicker, uh, feeds on ants on the ground, like our flicker, and it's part of the mixed flock, uh, and it, it's trailing the army ant swarms, these raid groups, and um, picking off flying insects, um, and they sort of perch themselves up in a tree or shrub like uh, we're seeing here, with a lot of access to fly off rather than just on a tree trunk, and they'll pick off flying insects that the ant swarms, army ant swarms, are uh, are disrupting. It's a beautiful bird. Okay, one more time for fun. Here's the um, ruddy um, wood creeper, and this is the bard. And let's watch him. Watch for the ants in the middle of the two birds. There it is, waiting for an insect to pop up. Oh, <laughs> got it. One more time. I sort of like these little videos, so I guess you have to put up with me playing them over and over. But if you can see all the ants on your large screen, you really get an idea of the volume of ants and uh, how they can uh, pick up other insects that the birds will feed on. So the predators, that's the third part of the army ant uh, mixed flock uh, ecology. And here's a Cooper's hawk. It's a forest excipiter, as we all know. We have them in uh, in California in big numbers, and they uh, they'll find a, a secret spot that the sentry birds may not uh, be aware that they're around, and they'll swoop on and uh, down onto the mixed flock and take a bird that hasn't been paying attention. And of course, uh, once that happens, the sentry birds really start calling. It's a little late, but uh, everyone's excited. So uh, the other bird that we see uh, is the perigenous pygmy owl. Uh, there's 50 species of owls in the neotropics. Uh, and ornithologists have determined through surveys that the perigenous is the most common owl in um, Central America. And uh, I think we had this bird this past March, both in Belize and in um, uh, Guatemala. I know we had it in two or three locations in Belize, and we may have had it in uh, Tikal. It's um, not uncommon to run into this uh, this bird, particularly at uh, dusk when it starts its hooting. I think we're all familiar with the uh, pygmy owl hoot in our northern forests, and it's the same hoot that it gives in the neotropics. Um, and they feed also on the ant birds that are unsuspecting um, and that the sentry birds have not noticed and haven't put out a, a warning and they'll come down and, and take a, a, a bird on the ground. Uh, we have some large exhibitors in Central America. Uh, this is a um, bicolored hawk. It's really an exhibitor um, and there's also a tiny hawk. I don't have a photo, unfortunately, 
in our typical uh, coopers and sharp string hawks all hunt the forest and they all are part of the army ant ecology. I'm praying on the army ant birds, not on the army ants. So in California, we have our own mixed feeding flocks that occur. Uh, this is at a bird bath. There is our oak titmouse and bush tits. And uh, I think we're all familiar with our mixed flocks uh, in California, particularly uh, with the leading birds. I don't know that we call them so much a sentry bird. I call them more of a leader. And that is the bush tits. We see them going from tree to trees. And sometimes we get um, nut hatches with them. We get warblers, sometimes orange crown warblers, um, hermit warblers, all any of the warblers, chickadees, vireos, all participate in this incre in, uh, increased feeding efficiency. Um, our birds uh, aren't so much feeding on ants. We don't have an obligate ant uh, species in our northern uh, North America, uh, but they feed on insects under leaves. Um, in gardens, woodlots, backyard feeders, they come through. Uh, this downy woodpecker uses titmice as a sentinel for, for itself while feeding in a mixed flock. Woodpeckers, you know, they get pretty focused on whatever branch or tree they're on looking for grubs and beetles. And uh, the titmice are their sentinel, if we can call them that, here in North America that will alert a downy that maybe there's a sharp shin hawk in the neighborhood and it's got to be more alert or maybe even leave. So in North America, we have our mixed flocks. They're uh, not particular to army ants and what army ants can kick up off of the uh, forest floors. Um, our mixed flocks tend to be a little bit more cosmopolitan in parks and backyard feeders. And uh, so we're pretty much over. I wanna thank uh, Janet, uh, Bodo, Oop, I forgot to put a capital B there. Sorry, honey. Uh, Janet does editing and helped me on some of the um, videos with the ant birds and other support. And Barry, as he mentioned, he, uh, he and I have been friends for probably 30 plus years and uh, share this big interest in birds and conservation. Uh, All About Birds is a good site. Um, if you want to look at more photos um, on ant birds themselves, uh, the Neotropic Companion Field Guide by John Kitcher was really helpful. Uh, the Peterson Guides to Birds of North and Central America. It's got a real nice um, uh, footprint. It's a small field guide. Um, and next to the bird artwork or photo is the range maps. So that's a, if you're planning any trips into Central America, you might want to take the Peterson Field Guide. Um, its size is good. The information is good. Uh, Birds of Panama, uh, that was very helpful, and Birds of Belize um, by H. Lee Jones is very helpful. So um, we're planning, Yellow Bill Tours is planning uh, their 2023 schedule for Panama in January, Belize in March, Guatemala to follow Belize. And if you're interested in these trips, um, I don't have the full itineraries up for 2023. Uh, they'll be up in about a month but you can uh, re remember the website, yellowbilltours.com. Uh, my cell number, if you prefer to call me and talk about the field trips, uh, we can do that. This photo is of the red cap mannequin and uh, they also follow army ants. This is a male and female on a uh, water trough in Tikal, um, Guatemala. So Barry, I, we're open for questions. And you know, when you were talking, I was thinking, when those army ants go through, when they swarm through, there must be a lot of noise. Well, you know, in the tropics, um, birds are always calling. And um, when they're on the ground feeding, um, they go into sort of a silent stage. Those, uh, the uh, videos that I had of the wood creepers uh, were not calling. Um, you will hear the sentry birds call. And that's how we, um, in most cases, uh, are alerted that there's um, uh, ant birds on the ground or close or coming in. And um, that's when we start looking around and that's when we'll find um, ant swarms at our feet uh, going through the forest. Many times we find the ant swarms um, 
as we're looking up the trail and get a get a little head start on it. But often we're looking up in the trees because we're hearing a, a lot of um, bird song and activity. So we're focused there. Um, but once uh, we get focused on birds on the ground, um, they, they tend to go silent, probably because of uh, don't wanting to alert uh, predators that um, they're feeding. I was just curious with that ferruginous um, pygmy owl, if it had, if it, if like the northern pygmy owl has the feathers on the back of its head that look like there's eyes. And I was just wondering if it had that same kind of pattern. Yes, it does. Um, this particular bird um, was photographed um, behind Crooked Tree Reservoir. We stay at the Bird's Eye View Lodge, and there's a uh, what they call a, um, a sandy pine forest. Uh, it's the old lake bed uh, that has receded, and it has a long needle pine forest. And this bird uh, had exactly that. We um, had a number of photos that stuck around for maybe a full half an hour. In fact, we left before it left, and we have photos of the back of the head with the uh, feathers that look like eyes. That is uh, protection from other predators coming in. They think that um, the bird sees them and will put up a fight, so they don't. They're not preyed on. That's interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think John is going to come and ask you a question. John is our national parks uh, guru. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Richard. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you don't need to be Yeah, perfect. Oh. Okay. oh, okay. I, I was, again, on the uh, Phrygianus pygmy owl, I remember reading a few years ago that uh, that was a bird that only, doesn't fly more than five feet in the air, uh, out mm. of the ground, that is. Have you heard that? Or well, um, I haven't, but everyone in the tropics that I've ever seen has been maybe 10 feet or higher. This bird's probably at eight feet. Um, oh, I haven't man. seen them that low. Even here in, in uh, West Marin, I, I've seen them a few times. In Alameda County, um, in Del Val Park, um, I've seen them. And they're always, you know, they're they're... I'm five and a half feet and they're always up higher than I am. So six feet, 10 feet, eight feet. Yeah, I've never seen them that low. Solid owls, you know, I've seen them very low in, uh, in, in uh, conifers, but they're a smaller bird. Yeah. Uh, the reason I brought it up is I remember reading in a Sierra Club bulletin, and I hate to get <laughs> politically, I don't, I don't offend anybody, but <laughs> someone was really concerned during the last administration that if the wall were built, it would be really bad for the Phrygianus pygmy owl because they, in well, their that's the pattern, they can't fly more than five feet off the ground or not. It doesn't sound like your understanding is much more than that. Yeah. Um, so my knowledge of the um, Southwest uh, Phrygianus pygmy owl, um, particularly the ones around Tucson and further south that live in sororal cactus, yes, they do not nest. Um, their nest is within five feet of of the of the ground, and they're you know they're um, um, severely endangered because of course development. And probably the the wall that um, uh, that the last administration put up, they're not able to migrate. And we probably, you know, some of what you're saying I think is valid. Um, we won't get new birds coming in if they can't fly over the fence to try to repopulate. You know, there is they do migrate somewhat. Um, we so yeah, that creates a whole nother nightmare for this species and. Um, conservation in southwest Arizona. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm, I'm going to look into that. That's good. a good question. I'd like to know more about it. But the, the owls in uh, the southwest um, uh, are a little, they're a subspecies of our northern uh, pygmy owl, excuse me, uh -huh. and they habitat um, sororal cactus for nesting. So it very well could be what you're saying is accurate. I've been on the King Ranch in um, south southwest Texas, and they have um, 
the uh, Caribbean uh, subspecies, if you will, um, Central America subspecies of the uh, Phrygianus pygmy owl. And um, if I recall, um, those birds are a little bit mig uh, migratory and they get new birds in. And so the gene pool is very healthy in Texas for the Phrygianus pygmy owl. They don't have a fence there. This is actually, this is an ant question. Um, you said that they don't bother humans, is that right? Yes. Okay, well, this is about a movie, so you know how movies <laughs> okay. stretch, the, stretch the facts. Um, when I was a kid, which has been a long time ago, I saw this movie that I think was called The Naked Jungle. And mm -hmm. it was in South America, and there were these, what you call them, a raid of ants really wide, like you described, that were coming towards this ranch area or whatever, and they were eating everything. They were not eating just the bugs, but they were eating all of the uh, the, the growth and, and everything. And so that was making this naked jungle. And uh, it was very frightening to me. It left a big impression. And so they probably were army ants like you're describing, but it sounds like they were misconstruing what the army ants actually do. Could be, I'm not familiar with the movie, um, but you know, uh, there has been um, the invasion of the red ants and one or two other ants that have come in from Africa through South America, sort of uh, the same way we got cattle egrets. I, I believe that they've traced some of these uh, new exotic ants uh, from the African continent uh, on cattle barges and, and boats. And mm -hmm. they're slowly making their way into North America. I know the Department of Agriculture, while I was doing uh, this research for this Zoom, um, has uh, a number of um, links into how to control different um, uh, invasive ant species that aren't native to the Western Hemisphere. Yeah, so there are uh, excuse me, there are um, these new ant species coming in that are invasive and there is there are no predators and they're going to have to be controlled with chemicals or whatever means that Department of Agriculture is very concerned about crops because they do eat a lot of different things that our native ants don't. Well, Rich, following up on the Jan's question, if I were to stand uh, in the middle of uh, the path when an army ant uh, swarm is coming along, uh, what would they do or what would I do? I think you, knowing you as long as I do have, you would be amazed and you would be probably taking photos or videos. Uh, they would probably be walking over your boots and shoes and keep going. Once in a while, you might get one or two coming up your pants. But, um, you know, basically they're not, um, and they're not aggressive against humans. These are nomads, and you're going to always get a couple uh, scouts that are out, and they might like the color of your trousers or and find them walking up your pant leg, but they're, they're not going to stay with you. <laughs> yeah, I see. Okay, good. Does anybody else have any questions? Anybody on, on Zoom got a question? Well, Rich, I think we're going, to, we're going to enjoy our refreshments and we're going to let you go off and enjoy your glass of wine with your beautiful wife, which seems okay, to be well, like a pretty you. good idea. Oh, thank so you. It's been I like great that. to see you. Great. Well, we'll stay in touch. And uh, thanks, everyone, for hanging out tonight with us. And uh, we look forward to uh, maybe getting on one of your field trips. I see Kit has a trip to uh, the red area. Where is that? It's that plant um, area, Red Hill. I think it's called Red Hill. Yeah, we went to we went we went to Red Hill. Oh, you did. We're taking a, a trip this in month. Virginia this Monday. <laughs> or the Pelican Trail in the San Joaquin yeah. in the River National yeah, Wildlife Refuge. Uh, you might like take a look at the uh, newsletter to find out when that that is. But that would be not too far for you, since you yeah. uh, like driving. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that'll be good. Okay. Well, good night, everybody. It's been, it's been great to hang out with you. Good night. Good night.